everyone hear me okay? Awesome. Well, welcome to our first of three plenaries. Um, the first, of course, is Dr. Mercedes Burns. Um, I wanted to start by saying that because I'm the scientific planner, it might seem like I just slotted in one of my longtime good friends, um, former postdoc mentor, uh, now turned colleague. Um, but I'm actually here to tell you that it was this awesome community that put Mercedes and our other two plenaries um, up here in the spotlight. Um, so Mercedes, Yvonne, and Lauren were in the top nominated candidates for plenary spots when we first sent out that original um, solicitation when we began planning. So I think it's just really wonderful that you all are responsible for not only these wonderfully diverse individuals, but also the diverse arachnids that they're gonna be talking about. Um, so with that said, uh, Mercedes did her undergrad at McAllister College, which is near her hometown of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, when she was finished with that, she had the option of going and studying reproductive polymorphisms in dung beetles or sexual conflict in apileonids with Jeff Schultz at University of Maryland. And I think we all know that she chose correctly. Um, Mercedes seemingly won all of the NSF awards that you could possibly win during her undergraduate career or her, sorry, excuse me, her graduate career. She got the Graduate Research Fellowship. She got the doctor, Doctoral Dissertation Improvement Grant. And she capped it all off with the Postdoctoral Research Fellowship. She did her postdoc with Marshall Hedin at San Diego State University. And it was here that she studied, started studying the, the Liabunum species from Japan that she's still currently working on. For the past several years, she has been in a tenure track position at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, uh, where I postdoc with her for a couple years. Um, and she's been going back and forth to Japan and we're gonna hear all about her Japanese species today. Um, so Mercedes, I'm super thrilled that you're here. Welcome. Um, and with that, I'll let you take it away. Okay, um, Sarah, can is this visualizing well? You have a couple of black boxes. Um, do you have right. anything open in the background yeah. that you could close? I'm gonna um, delete the, um, so if other people can let folks in from the waiting room, um, I'll try to. Yeah, can we take, well, I guess she has to be a co-host. So every time something pops up from the Zoom, it puts a box on her screen. Um, I'll just allow everyone to share screen. And then I believe she will not have to be a co-host. So then I'll just remove her co-hosting permissions, but everything should work out just fine. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sarah, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you all for having me. This is my first plenary talk ever. And um, I'm so glad to be doing it for an organization that I really care about and um, on organisms that I love. And I think you'll all agree that um, Apileones are the best of the arachnids. And so they should go first in the plenary <laughs> talks. Um, so I've given you a, a pretty long title for my uh, plenary talk today, which is called, um, or starts with the eight-legged flowers of Chubu. And um, throughout the presentation, I'll kind of explain where these terms come from. Um, but I'll start by just saying that Chubu is this region in blue here that you can see that I've put a box around. It's a very mountainous um, temperate area. Um, it's uh, quite cold at the tops of these mountains. Um, and it's home to a lot of interesting flora and fauna, um, and particularly these eight-legged apileones, which I love to study. Um, and the um, research that I'm gonna be presenting to you is on work that we've done to look at the genome and cytotypic distribution of these species. Um, and the main reason that I got interested in studying them um, has to do with the fact that they're facultatively parthenogenetic. So that's one of the most important terms that I want you all to take away from this talk. So I'll go through what that means. So facultative means it's optional or it could happen. And parthenogenesis is actually Greek for virgin birth. So essentially we're talking about asexual reproduction that's done by females and it creates more females. Um, and so we in the evolutionary biology community that study sex um, sometimes think of facultative parthenogenesis as kind of the ideal reproductive mode. 
And you'll see why when you look at this Bateman's gradient um, that I've put here from Burke and Bondurianski, um, where on the x-axis for these two graphs, you see the number of matings, and on the y-axis, you see the fitness. And um, those of you that have taken an introductory evolution course will know that um, from um, the direct fitness perspective of an individual that's an obligate sexual, so they can only reproduce sexually, um, they have no fitness when they haven't mated. They aren't passing on their genes directly to offspring. Um, but a facultative parthenogen has the ability or has a set fitness associated with asexual reproduction because they can do that. Um, and they can actually increase their fitness in some instances through select meetings with preferred partners. So um, the uh, facultative asexuals are unlike obligate asexual lineages because they need not be considered evolutionary dead ends, meaning that they're still generating genetic diversity through the ability to reproduce sexually. Another intriguing variation within the curve of palpi group that these facultative parthenogens I study belong to um, is uh, related to the number of chromosomes they have. The, that variation occurs in and between members of this group. So here's a closely related obligate sexual species, Liobutum hariwai, and you can see that males from these uh, populations, A, B, and C, actually have only 20 chromosomes, whereas males from populations D and E have 22. Um, and so manubriatum kind of takes this idea to a whole new level because manubriatum has a diploid cytotype as well as a tetraploid cytotype. Um, and liobutum globosum, um, as far as we know, is entirely tetraploid, both males and females, and is most closely related to the tetraploid uh, lineage of liobutum manubriatum. So when I first kind of started working on this group, um, my understanding was that uh, Liobutum manubriatum um, diploids were found only in the Chuba region down here, um, and the remainder populations were all tetraploid. So we're talking about an animal species that has multiple reproductive modes and higher ploidy and mountainous regions, uh, which means that we're almost talking about a plant. <laughs> um, because we know of many plant species, such as this uh, Goldilocks buttercup, that have a variety of ploides, in this case, um, closely related species are diploid all the way up to octoploid. Um, and they tend to be found in regions that have been previously glaciated um, where you can see these tetraploid uh, populations within central uh, Europe. So um, when we're trying to study the significance of facultative parthenogenesis, we tend to have to go to the plant literature. Um, and that's why I think of these organisms as sort of eight-legged flowers. So here are those facultative parthenogens of Japan again. Here's manubriatum, a male, and a globosum male. And you can see their populations um, look sort of similar to what you see for the plant that I just showed, um, except now that we're looking at um, not ploidy, but population uh, sex ratio. So if you look into the northern islands of uh, Hokkaido, the northern populations of the Tohoku region where Aomori is, you can see that there are many populations that are female only, or males are very rare. And it's only in the Chuba region of um, the uh, Honshu where you can see there are males that are much more common. So for many reasons, this is a really interesting region of Japan for me to study these things in. So getting back to that comment I made about evolutionary biologists considering facultative parthenogenesis so rare, um, but, but still um, an important or still an ideal reproductive mode, you might be thinking, okay, well, if that's such a great reproductive mode, why have I never heard of it before? Why do I not know any animals that reproduce this way? Um, and we think there's a couple reasons for this. And the first is that there are significant barriers to asexual reproduction. Um, so in uh, an ob obligate reproducing organism, in order to make that jump from sex to asex, an organism has to produce gametes that are unreduced. So they need to have the full complement of chromosomes necessary for um, the, the zygote to develop. Um, and so this is typically done in individuals that are parthenogenetic through some interaction with polar bodies that are produced naturally during meiosis or through whole genome duplications, whether before or after the gamete is actually produced. Secondly, uh, traits that favor sex appear to often disfavor parthenogenesis. And this is well understood, at least for mammals. So the reason why you've never heard of a parthenogenetic mammal species is that there's such a thing as genome, uh, genetic imprinting. 
So this is a schematic of chromosome seven in mice. And you can see that all of these genes need to be supplied by the proper parent. So these blue colored genes need to come from sperm and they need to be methylated in order for the zygote that is being produced to develop. So that's a significant barrier to parthenogenesis for organisms that have imprinting like this. So in order to chart a path towards understanding why evolution, why sex has evolved in this otherwise asexual species, and to understand how these things can be maintained in one organism, we needed to start by having a map of, of the genome that occurs in these facultative parthenogens, which hadn't been done before. So I'd always thought that at some point I would be a part of sequencing a genome. And so luckily in 2019, I was able to actually do this. So um, my then postdoc, Sarah Stellwagen, and I traveled to Japan to work with my colleague there, Nobuo Sarasaki. Um, so we collected about 200 uh, manubriatum from a population that we believe to be entirely diploid. Uh, we dissected those individuals to remove parasites and we extracted DNA from those individuals. And we were able to sequence um, the full diploid genome of this organism um, with pretty decent coverage. Um, and the initial assembly took about three months and about uh, 15 terabytes of digital space, but um, it, you know this would happen during the pandemic, so it was a good use of time, I would say. Um, and um, we uh, estimate the diploid genome of this organism to be between 450 and 550 megabases with very large, uh, good-sized contigs. Um, we developed a Busco database, so these are single copy orthologs that we expect to see within the genome of the organism based on closely related species genomes. At this time, there was no Apillona genome that had been um, uh, produced. So we were sort of limited, but we cobbled together um, a, uh, a Busco database of arthropods and arachnids. And so our resultant uh, assembly was about 97% complete based on that Busco database. Um, so that's quite good. Um, and I, I should have mentioned, we used Oxford MinION um, device so that we were able to do this sequencing entirely in a house. And in fact, um, some of the work was done from literally our houses. So uh, one thing that we discovered in the assembly of this genome was something that uh, if you've done any molecular eco ecological work, you're likely familiar with, and these are called new mites. So new mites are actually nuclearized mitochondrial genes so they're genes that um, should be, or, or that are uh, reminiscent of the mitochondrial genome, which I'm showing here for Liabunum manubriatum, but they're found in the nucleus. And specifically, we found the equivalent of one and a half mitochondrial full genomes interspersed with nuclear and low identity sequence, which I'm showing here. So you can see based on color coding, we've got some genes that are associated with the mitochondrion that are interspersed with some sequence that we didn't find in the mitochondrial genome, as well as some nuclear sequence. And um, there were four reads specifically that had this sequence. Um, so we realized that chimeras from the sequencing process with the minion were very unlikely because we had interspersed short reads of our short sequences of nuclear genomes, and we had four reads that had this sequence. So we realized that we were working with some very large new mites. Um, and what specifically concerned us about these new mites is that the sequence identity of these reads to the mitochondrial genome was in some cases quite high. And when we compared these reads to the assembly that we created with all of our sequence data, that um, sequence identity improved in some cases significantly. And so we were worried that what these reads were was being sort of um, erroneously corrected by the mitochondrial genome. So in doing some reading to try to understand the mechanism by which uh, mit mitochondrial genes end up in the nucleus, we were a bit stymied, but we learned that there's quite a lot of variation in new mite abundance among eukaryotes, with humans having lots of new mites, um, single-celled uh, eukaryotes like plasmodium, which causes malaria, having almost no new mites, probably related to the fact it has very few mitochondria. Um, and the one consistent thing we were able to derive from the papers we read was that germline instability is potentially um, related to abundance of new mites. So fancy that, germline instability is much more common in parthenogens, we think. Um, so this is actually a paper from a stem cell journal 
which shows that the rate of development of these abnormal centrioles, which are related to um, chromosome doubling and, and development during meiosis, um, and so blastomeres are zygotes that are doing this, um, is much higher for parthen parthenogens. So here they did the work with pig uh, cells. So these are parthenotes. These are zygotes that are um, incited to start developing, but they're not going to develop fully because of that genetic imprinting issue that I described before for mammals. And compared to biparental zygotes, um, these uh, parthenogenetic ones have quite a bit more abnormal centrioles. And so we can see that in this image where we've got these supernumerary centrioles. So these are centriole pairs here, here, and here, which are separating the chromosomes that have condensed. Um, so new cells are going to develop from these separations. And these red spots are actually uh, microtubules that are forming. So you can imagine that mitochondria, which also have to separate and, and double for the development of the zygote, um, may be pulled along with these microtubules and end up being inserted into the nuclear genome. So perhaps new mites are more common for parthenogens because germline instability is. So the research that we've done with this genome um, has a couple of impl implications. Uh, so specifically with respect to sequencing, uh, for folks that are researching specifically unusual insertions like new mites, we need to keep real mitochondrial DNA from the, from the, the mitochondrial genome from interfering with uh, nuclear assemblies. The only paper we found where um, a new mite of the size um, that we have um, was found in the, the, uh, this, the assembly was from this paper on primates, specifically on the Philippines tarsier, which had a very large uh, new mite. So they were doing sequencing with short reads. So they had to verify that this truly was a new mite and not a mitochondrial breed uh, using Western blots. Um, and so they were specifically interested in pseudogenes and insertions like this. Um, so you can see where as we continue to sequence uh, genomes with these um, uh, third generation sequencing technologies, we need to ensure um, that we know what's real mitochondria and what is not. Were there also several evolutionary implications? First, which is something that you know, we're already doing, we can track the evolution of species and specifically mitochondrial haplotypes by using um, mitochondrial um, insertions into the nucleus. Um, we know that at least in some organisms, mitochondrial um, DNA in the nucleus is responsible for repair of double-stranded DNA breaks. But what is perhaps the most exciting from my perspective is that these types of new mites may be a vehicle for biparental mitochondrial DNA inheritance. So this paper um, from Bay et al. just recently came out and they studied several um, human families. So this is a pedigree showing that this individual number two in generation four received mitochondrial DNA from their mother, um, but a large, they actually called a mega new mite from their father. And when we look at heteroplasmy um, of uh, different tissues from this individual, specifically from blood, buccal um, scraped cells, and a urinalysis, we see that there's much higher heteroplasmy in tissues that have less mitochondrial activity. So blood, it has this higher heteroplasmy, which may present an opportunity for um, differential expression of mitochondrial DNA from this mega new mite if it's sort of uh, maintained in the nucleus. So this is a fascinating result that bears further study, I think. Okay, so going back to this slide where I showed you chromosomal variation that occurs in and between members of this uh, opilionid curvipalpi group, I showed you this image um, and said that at the time I started working on these species, my understanding of the transition line between diploid manubriatum to tetraploid manubriatum was somewhere in that tuber region. And so early research I did showed that there was at least one population where we found both diploid and tetraploid cytotypes. So I wanted to understand what the significance was of this putative cytotypic transitional zone. So that's what I'll talk for the second, uh, talk about for the second part of my plenary. Um, is my efforts to try to figure out what underlies the distribution of the two cytotypes. Now, um, I don't have the time that Nobuo had in order to do karyotyping. And as a postdoc, I certainly didn't have the money to do the sequencing that would be necessary to elucidate uh, ploidy of 
many individuals from the Tubu region. So I turned to a completely different method for identifying ploidy of individuals, which is called FACS or fluorescence associated cell sorting or flow cytometry. And the idea of this type of research, and here's the instrument back there, um, is that we uh, fluorescently label populations of cells from the organism of interest. Um, we pass those in front of a laser and based on the forward scatter and side scatter um, of the fluorescence of these cells, we're able to develop a histogram, which on the y-axis shows the counts of cells or cell parts um, that have been fluorescently labeled. And on the x-axis shows the fluorescence. So um, the largest peak uh, for a normal populations of cells is going to indicate cells that are in growth phase. Um, and so that is directly related to the ploidy of um, that individual. So in order to identify libunum manubriatum diploids and tetraploids, I needed to have some known diploids and tetraploids that um, had similar, uh, if not identical, uh, genome sizes. So that was kind of tricky because this was happening concurrently with the genome uh, research we were doing. So I went to known diploids that were closely related species. So liabinum hiraiwai down here, uh, or up here in liabinum tohokuenzi, are um, obligate sexual species that we know to be diploid. Um, and globosum, as I mentioned before, is an entirely tetraploid species. And so that worked as my uh, tetraploid model for what these histograms look like. Um, and um, from these data, I developed a logit model that I used as training data uh, where I took uh, features of these peaks in order to identify properly uh, diploids and tetraploids. So here's the populations that I sampled from for this um, uh, cytotypic work. And you'll see that um, throughout all the localities, about two thirds of the sample that I had um, turned out to be diploids and the remainder tetraploid. Um, when I break this down so that you can see the separate populations, and so these circles are um, consistent with the size of the population that I sampled from, so quite a few from this Mount Haranoki. Um, I had originally expected to see that as we went up in uh, latitude or went up in elevation, I would see the shift from uh, mostly blue or di diploid individuals to mostly orange or tetraploid individuals. Um, and that didn't really happen. So if I take that backward or background map away and then show you just the proportion of tetraploids associated with um, different elevations, um, I didn't see, uh, and also models where I included latitude as a covariate, I didn't see um, a slope for that line that significantly differed from y equals zero. So there isn't a clear relationship between those geographic characteristics and the populations of cytotypes. So that's strange because I had expected, again, based on the plant literature, that um, we would see populations that would be um, identified based on some of these um, characteristics that are associated with what's called the polyploid hop. So when diploid lineages undergo whole genome duplications, we see uh, the effects of increased physiological tolerance as well as um, niche expansion associated with colonization that favor these polyploid lineages quite a bit. And the reason for that is that under a whole genome duplication, we're now seeing um, uh, genes that normally were required for a particular function that if that organism can deal with dosage compensation, those genes are allowed to neo-functionalize and do new functions for that organism. Um, and that comes as a cost though. So um, as these lineages of polyploids um, age, there are uh, problems associated with mutation and larger transposable element loads um, that make these populations more likely to undergo extinction. They're also being occasionally diluted with gene flow from the diploid population that they came from. Um, so we expect that um, however short-lived these polyploids are is related to how fast this sort of mutational and transposable element load catches up with the lineage. So um, in past work, we had tried to understand the advantages to polyploidy for apiliones by looking at things like size and fecundity. We can't identify differences between tetraploids and diploids. Um, so now we're starting to think about potential for oogenesis being different between those two cytotypes. And the reason for that is um, in this paper that I recently published, 
with my graduate student, Tyler Brown, uh, you can see that we were looking at the probability that offspring are clones, are partial clones of their mother. Um, so uh, essentially they're being produced through asexual reproduction uh, for populations of um, manubriatum from the north and from the south. So um, in the north, we expect the majority of these individuals to be tetraploid. And because males are so rare there, we expect that the probability that they're, the offspring are clones to be higher. And on average, we found that to be the case. Um, and so vice versa, we expect in, uh, for manubriatum from the south, offspring are gonna have a lower clone probability because it's more likely for females to mate here since males are available to them. But we did have individuals like this female number 514 that had a very high mean clone probability for her offspring, even though she was from the South. And so, you know, if we swap this idea to consider that these are mostly tetraploids and these females are diploids and tetraploids, a mix, we're wondering if perhaps there's something more to this female. Um, perhaps she was a tetraploid and had primed her eggs for asexual development. So this is a concept that's prom been promoted by some of my colleagues, um, but no one has any sort of experimental evidence to show that it's possible. Of course, another thing that we need to do next is to sequence the tetraploid genome um, and understand how functional that second genome copy is, that homologous genome. Um, so luckily we have sort of a roadmap to do this because the allotetraploid Xenopus lavis um, has um, gone through this sort of research. So Xenopus is a, a toad frog species, sorry, that um, is commonly used for developmental biology work. Um, and we know that um, this species has essentially two diploid genomes, two homologous genomes, one of which is very transcriptionally active and the other of which is mostly wrapped in chromatin and doesn't have many genes that haven't been pseudogenized yet. And so um, through a number of experiments, uh, this research group was able to show that essentially Xenopus lavis is really a functionally diploid, but has uh, a second homologous genome that um, no longer is especially active. So, so it's functionally diploid. And so we're interested in whether that will be the case uh, for um, Liabunum manubriatum as well. Okay, so I've given you plenty of things to think about. Sorry, I'm gonna try to uh, get rid of that floating meeting control again. Um, and I wanna make sure to give some uh, particular thanks to my funding uh, associations a land acknowledgement to the Ainu and Matagi peoples of Japan um, who formerly controlled the regions where we do our research, as well as the Piscataway and Susquehanna nations of the Maryland region um, who formerly uh, resided upon the land where my university is. Um, I want to acknowledge my collaborator, Nobuo Surasaki, who I've been working with since I began my postdoc. Um, a few students uh, from UMBC who have been involved with various parts of this research. Um, I want to call out Paula Cushing and Jeff Schultz. Um, this past year has been really a struggle for me in a lot of different ways, um, and I really appreciate their support. Um, and of course, I have to <laughs> I have to thank my ride or die friend Sarah Stellwagen, um, not just for the great introduction, uh, but also being an integral part of this research. Um, and working with her, I think, really underscores the power that comes from two badass female scientists doing awesome work. And I'm so excited to continue to collaborate with her. Um, so with that, I'll just uh, give you my contact information at the bottom there. And I look forward to answering some of your questions if there's time. Thank you. All right. I'm sure everyone is clapping and hollering. And I thought- that was Oh, I was wrong. clapping for myself. Well, oh, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, thanks, Mercedes. We have a couple minutes for questions before we um, pop over into breakout rooms for the rest of the talks. Um, feel free to put your your uh, questions in the chat. Um, Mercedes is going to be monitoring, and I can I know she can see it from there. I haven't had any um, just yet, but as they come in, I'll grab them, and sh if she sees them first, you can just read them directly out to uh, Mercedes. But <laughs> nice video. <laughs> <laughs> this was a video from when we went to Japan and saw some of their dancers on the roof um, outside of our hotel room. It was really fun to watch. So um, in the meantime, I know I was a postdoc in your lab and I should know this, but is this the only part the genetic apiliones that we know of at this point? Are there 
other species, yeah, so, other parts so of the there's world? There's a number of apiliones um, and spiders as well that are only known from female populations. Uh, so we think that they're probably asexual because males have never been identified. Um, what's, what's sort of beneficial about uh, these liabunum species is that we've actually behaviorally um, assessed whether they're asexual by uh, collecting them at a, a juvenile stage, uh, rearing them up, letting them lay their eggs, um, and letting those eggs develop and hatch. So at no point were they ever able to mate. Um, and so that's what's called sort of behavioral um, assessment of, of parthenogenesis. And then there's a question from Jessica Garb. Are you interested in estimating new mite integration frequency within and across populations, maybe using targeted genome resequencing? Yeah, so um, that would be particularly important if we want to follow this idea that um, there's potentially biparental inheritance of um, mitochondrial DNA. So, you know, the central dogma of mitochondrial research is that you get your mitochondrial sequence from your mother, right? So, um, you know, this might pre present an important um, difference between uh, facultatively parthenogenetic and um, obligately parthenogenetic lineages if there's possibility for male um, parental DNA or mitochondrial inheritance, because you could see where that operates Statistically, could rescue mitochondrial um, DNA that's either sort of mismatched with um, the nuclear genome um, of parthenogens or is um, sort of lacking. So if there's um, low mitonuclear concordance, for example, um, and we do know plenty of like obligately um, asexual species where um, they're sort of limited in their development based on like lagging fitness due to like uh, low fecundity. So um, there are issues associated with how the mitochondrial uh, gene products and nuclear gene products interact with each other within the cytoplasm um, that could be affected by um, having mitochondrial DNA that's transcribed from the nucleus. So. Um, so yeah, so one way to go about it would be to do targeted gene resequencing um, because we know, we know where those new mites are. They're large enough that we would probably want to employ um, 